News of the Times Eccentric Sundays William Stead Seer and Victorian Influencer Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode of Eccentric Sundays, we look at William Stead, who initially came to our attention with the famous Eliza Armstrong case. Stead came up again during our research of personages of the Victorian paranormal. Messages from the Dead, buyer of children, editor of the paper The Pall Mall, as well as being a huge proponent of spiritualism. Stead also had a connection with the Titanic. William Stead was an intriguing individual and a true Victorian influencer. Join us as we explore the story of this unique Victorian individual who had a lasting impact in England to this day. We hope you enjoy the show. William Thomas Stead Stead, referred by some as the father of investigative journalism, was a many-sided individual and a true English Victorian in the sense of being at the forefront of society at the time. Born in Northumberland in 1849, his family were respectable middle class with a congregational minister father and a socially conscious mother. Stead was homeschooled by his father and became very well versed in Bible teachings. His mother was an activist against social injustice, a path Stead himself would follow through the medium of the printed page. Stead, the Paranormalist Before we delve into the aspects Stead is most famous for, let's jump ahead and take a look at the lesser-known spiritualist side of him. In 1886, Stead wrote a short story about a vessel where the majority of the passengers die because there are not enough lifeboats. In 1892, Stead wrote another story of a ship colliding with an iceberg and survivors being rescued by another vessel. As you will see, this could be interpreted as a premonition of what was to come some 25 years later. Despite Stead's strong religious upbringing, Stead was a firm believer in the paranormal, most notably in automatic writing, where one's hand is guided by a spirit which writes messages. Stead believed he had the automatic writing gift and began to receive a barrage of messages from the other side through automatic writing. The spirit using his hand to write messages was a friend of his who had passed. The number of messages became so numerous that he had a member within his staff specifically to deal with the messages from the other side to be handed to specific people. He also received messages which he was told were to be published to the wider world in the paranormal community. Stead was highly respected. He was good friends with his fellow paranormal enthusiast, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It had been argued that Stead would have been far more influential if he had not been so forthcoming about his spiritualist meanings. Stead, the editor and investigative reporter. A highly intelligent young man, Stead became the youngest newspaper editor within the country of a small liberal paper at the age of 22, which he managed to expand to national levels. Always guided by his moral upbringing, his intention was to do good and to help change the world to make it a better place. He followed the example of his activist mother as well as the moral teachings of his father to use the medium of the press to help correct what he saw as social injustices. In 1880, Stead became the editor of the Pall Mall Gazette, later known as the London Evening Standard. From this influential position, Stead became the instigator of what was to be called the new journalism, as well as becoming a leader in the new field of investigative reporting. Much of what we take for granted now in our papers were innovations from Stead. 
The incorporation of maps and diagrams, the use of subheadings and using the newspaper platform for political support. A staunch government detractor, Stead used the platform of the paper to attempt to reform some of the social issues of the day. Some of the topics the paper was most vocal about included women's suffrage. Stead was a staunch supporter of women's right to vote. Poverty and inequality. The Pall Mall Gazette, under Stead's leadership, printed many articles on the plight of the poor and most notably Stead's view on the lack of action from the government in addressing this. Education. Stead believed firmly in the importance of education for all and advocated accessible quality education, especially for the poor and marginalised sections of society. Anti-slavery and human trafficking. Beyond his work on child prostitution, Stead also highlighted the issue of slavery and human trafficking. He wrote about the horrors of the slave trade and called for its abolition. However, the issue that Stead is most likely remembered for is his work on the social topic of child prostitution and his breakthrough investigative reporting in this field which successfully helped to change the law. Child prostitution. By the turn of the 1880s, a disturbing trend through the social work being undertaken was becoming revealed through a series of investigative reports by the Pall Mall Gazette under the leadership of Stead. The deeply troubling reality was that child prostitution had become shockingly prevalent with the illicit trafficking of young girls for such purposes reaching alarming levels. The series of shocking newspaper articles painted a grim picture of innocent lives devastated by this heinous trade. Many of the girls ensnared in this horrific trade were barely past the age of consent set at 13. The severity of the situation was further emphasised by accounts of girls as young as eight years old being tragically involved in this abhorrent practice. The investigative reports suggested that virgins were in high demand on the continent, with procurers and their clients engaged in clandestine transactions, often impoverished parents found themselves in the desperate position of considering the unthinkable, selling their daughters into the sex trade in hopes of securing a decent price. This is an excerpt of one of the many articles written by Stead on this issue. Be advised, the report is as disturbing today as it was in 1885. From the Pall Mall Gazette, July the 6th, 1885, the maiden tribute of modern Babylon, the confessions of a brothel keeper. The reporter, William Thomas Stead. Here, for instance, is a statement made to me by a brothel keeper who formerly kept a noted house in the Mile End Road, but who is now endeavouring to start life afresh as an honest man. I saw him and his wife, herself a notorious prostitute, whom he had married off the streets where she had earned her living since she was fourteen. Maids, as you call them, fresh girls as we know them in the trade, are constantly in request, and a keeper who knows his business has his eyes open in all directions. His stock of girls is constantly getting used up and needs replenishing, and he has to be on the alert for likely marks to keep up the reputation of his house. I have been in my time a good deal about the country on these errands. The getting of fresh girls takes time, but it is simple and easy enough when once you are in it. I have gone and courted girls in the country under all kinds of disguises, occasionally assuming the dress of a parson, and made them believe that I intended to marry them, and so got them in my power to please a good customer. How is it done? Why, 
After courting my girl for a time, I propose to bring her to London to see the sights. I bring her up, take her here and there, giving her plenty to eat and drink, especially drink. I take her to the theatre, and then I contrive it is so that she loses her last train. By this time she is very tired, a little dazed with the drink and excitement, and very frightened at being left in town with no friends. I offer her nice lodgings for the night. She goes to bed in my house, and then the affair is managed. My client gets his maid. I get my ten pounds or twenty pounds commission, and in the morning the girl, who has lost her character and dare not go home, in all probability will do as the others do, and become one of my marks. That is, she will make her living in the streets to the advantage of of my house. The brothel keeper's profit is, first, the commission down for the price of a maid, and secondly, the continuous profit of the addition of a newly seduced, attractive girl to his establishment. That is a fair sample case of the way in which we recruit. Another very simple mode of supplying maids is by breeding them. Many women who are on the streets have female children, and they are worth keeping. When you get to twelve or thirteen, they become merchantable. For a very likely mark of this kind, you may get as much as twenty or forty pounds. I sent my own daughter out on the streets from my own brothel. I know a couple of very fine little girls now who will be sold before very long. They are bred and trained for the life. They must take the first step sometime, and it is bad business not to make as much out of that as possible. Drunken parents often sell their children to brothel keepers. In the East End you can always pick up as many fresh girls as you want. In one street in Dalston you might buy a dozen. Sometimes the supply is in excess of the demand, and you have to seduce your maid yourself. or to employ someone else to do it, which is bad business in a double sense. Did I ever do anything else in the way of recruiting? Yes, I remember one case very well. The girl, a likely Mark, was a simple country lass living at Horsham. I had heard of her, and I went down to Horsham to see what I could do. Her parents believed that I was in regular business in London, and they were very glad when I proposed to engage their daughter. I brought her to town and made her a servant in our house. We petted her and made a good deal of her, gradually initiating her into the kind of life it was, and then I sold her to a young gentleman for fifteen pounds. When I say that I sold her, I mean that he gave me the gold and I gave him the girl to do what he liked with. He took her away and seduced her. I believe he treated her rather well afterwards, but that was not my affair. She was his after he'd paid for her and took her away. If her parents had inquired, I would have said that she had been a bad girl and run away with a young man. How could I help that? I once sold a girl twelve years old for twenty pounds to a clergyman who used to come to my house professedly to distribute tracts. The East is the great market for the children who are imported into West End houses or taken abroad wholesale when trade is brisk. I know of no West End houses having always lived at Dalston or thereabouts, but agents pass to and fro in the course of business, and they receive the goods, depart, and no questions are asked. The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon The Eliza Armstrong case, also known as The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon, was published in the Pall Mall Gazette in a series. It recounts the purchase of a thirteen-year-old Eliza known as Lily in the expose, from her mother, desperate for money to support her raging alcoholism, to be taken to a brothel for the rampant demand of young virgins for the sex trade within London 
and on the continent. As part of this expose, Stead orchestrated a controversial sting operation involving 13-year-old Eliza Armstrong. Stead, along with the help of a woman named Rebecca Jarrett, who acted as the intermediary, posed as a wealthy client seeking to purchase a young girl for immoral purposes. Jarrett acted as the go-between, and they arranged to buy 13-year-old Eliza Armstrong, known as Lily, within the news article, from her mother for the sum of five pounds. The transaction took place, and Eliza was taken to a brothel. Within the brothel, Stead, in order to ensure he was completely in character, drank considerable alcohol in advance. Eliza awakens to find herself in a room in a brothel with a drunken older man advancing. She screams, but no one comes. No actual physical harm took place with Eliza, and the intermediary Rebecca Jarrett was involved throughout to ensure that Eliza was not physically harmed. The investigative report, as recounted in The Maiden Tribute of Modern Babylon, revealed the shocking ease with which underage girls could be bought and sold into prostitution in London brothels. The public was outraged and loudly demanded action from the government to protect young girls from such exploitation. As a result of the public outcry, the British Parliament introduced the Criminal Law Amendment Act in 1885, raising the age of consent from 13 to 16 years of age and criminalising certain aspects of child prostitution and child trafficking. Stead's expose became a newspaper sellout, with the paper unable to keep up with demand. The government took action and quickly passed a previously twice delayed Criminal Law Amendment Act with some mild, better protection of younger girls. However, it was discovered from rival newspapers that it had been Stead himself who was the purchaser of the 13-year-old girl named Lily, real name Eliza Armstrong, that had been described in his newspaper articles. Now that the true identity of the girl was discovered, Eliza's parents were hounded by rival press media wanting to have confirmed that they had indeed sold their daughter into the sex trade for five pounds. Mrs. Armstrong stated that her understanding had been that Eliza would be placed into service as a household staff member. The father's permission had not been asked during the transaction. Stead was convicted of abduction and procurement and sentenced to six months in jail at Holloway, where he was treated as a first-class prisoner with a private room, fireplace, and frequent visits from his family. He was treated well by the prison guards and continued to edit the Pall Mall Gazette from within his cell. Stead, to the end of his days, believed that the expose had been a success and annually would dress in his prison garb on the anniversary of his incarceration. What happened to Eliza Armstrong? After the trial, Eliza was placed in a home for the protection of young girls, where she received schooling and training before going out to work in service. She did very well in the school and received an award for general good conduct. A place was found for her as a nursemaid to a family in Northumberland. Census reports show that she married a gas fitter and plumber in Islington, with whom she had three children. He died unexpectedly and she married again a few years later to a widower working as a lead worker. He also died young at the age of 48. Eliza and Stead kept in touch. Letters found depict a friendly relationship between the two with Eliza often thanking Stead for his kindness and for everything he had done for her. Eliza is recorded as having died at the age of 66 in County Durham in 1938. And what of Eliza's original family who allegedly were willing to sell her into the sex trade for £5?
In February 1886, Elijah's father was found guilty of assaulting his neighbour, Ellen Jones, who appeared in court with a fearfully discoloured eye and swollen cheek. He claimed she had fallen over whilst drunk. Eliza's 12-year-old brother was arrested for begging and he was taken to Paddington Workhouse. Eliza's mother, Elizabeth Armstrong, was arrested and imprisoned for 15 days in August 1888 for being drunk and disorderly and for assault. Quite soon after her arrest, Eliza's father was declared insane and taken to Colney Hatch Asylum, where he died in 1890. The Eliza Armstrong case had a profound impact on British society, leading to significant legal reforms and greater awareness of the plight of vulnerable young girls. It is often cited as an early example of investigative journalism using undercutter methods to expose social issues and advocate for change. Whilst the methods used by Stead were controversial and received criticism, his efforts ultimately contributed to positive legislative changes aimed at protecting children from exploitation and abuse. The End of Stead In 1912, William Stead boarded the Titanic for a trip to the United States and became one of the grim statistics of the 1,500-plus passengers who died. From survivors, he was mentioned several times as being one of those who helped to rescue women and children into the few existing lifeboats, and was also seen giving away his life jacket. Friends and family who knew him stated it was the type of person he was. He tried to walk his talk of support for his fellow man. The last he was reported as being seen was holding onto a chunk of wood with fellow passenger millionaire John Jacob Astor. Eventually the two froze in the icy water, let go of the wood they had clung to and drowned. A remarkable retelling in real life of the stories he had written some 25 years previously. Stead's Final Words Several years later, his daughter, Estella, was approached by the medium Pardo Woodman, who stated that her father, Stead, was sending messages to him through automatic writing. We end this episode with the reported message from the deceased Stead through the use of the medium's automatic writing, where Stead describes death and the afterlife. From the messages transcribed to Pardo Woodman, from deceased William Thomas Stead. A matter of minutes in time only, and here were hundreds of bodies floating in the water, dead, hundreds of souls carried through the air, alive, very much alive, some were. Many, realising their death had come, were enraged at their own powerlessness to save their valuables. They fought to save what they had on earth prized so much. The scene on the boat at the time of striking was not pleasant, but it is as nothing to the scene amongst the poor souls newly thrust out of their bodies, all unwillingly. It was both heartbreaking and repellent, and thus we waited, waited until all were collected, until all were ready, and then we moved our scene to a different land. It was a curious journey that, far more strange than anything that I had anticipated. We seemed to rise vertically into the air at terrific speed. As a whole, we moved, as if we were on a very large platform, and this was hurled into the air with gigantic strength and speed, and yet there was no feeling of insecurity. We were quite steady. I cannot tell you how long our journey lasted, nor how far from the earth we were when we arrived. But it was a gloriously beautiful arrival. It was all like walking from your own English winter gloom into the radiance of an Indian sky. 
There all was brightness and beauty. We saw this land far off when we were approaching, and those of us who could understand realized that we were being taken to the place destined for all those people who pass over suddenly. On account of its general appeal, it helps the nerve-wracked newcomer to fall into line and regain mental balance very quickly. We arrived feeling, in a sense, proud of ourselves. It was all lightness and brightness, everything as physical and quite as material in every way as the world we had just finished with. That concludes this episode of Eccentric Sundays, William Stead, seer and Victorian influencer. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers. And with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload six days a week. Fridays are a new limited series called Forgotten Fridays, where we explore a snapshot from newspaper articles, advertisements and publications of a time from long ago. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time span of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Sundays are eccentrics as we do an in-depth look at some of the quirky, unusual, notable and bizarre characters from Great Britain, which offers up a rich supply to choose from. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in depth a historical murder. Tuesdays are twisted and usually involve a collection of stories based around a theme, such as stories of matricide or when employers go bad. Wednesdays are wicked in this new series that will explore outrageous organisations, bloody locations and shocking events with a bit of murder and mayhem sprinkled in. From all of us at News of the Times, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News at the Times and I am Robin Coles.